So, science and dung. I'll cut out the crummy jokes at this point, but obviously I'm going to hopefully talk about good science, but I'm going to talk crap. And the vehicle that I'm going to use to explore science are dung beetles. And why on earth would a 56, and I, don't, I know I don't look 56, 56-year-old man spend his life playing with small insects and poo. And if you watch this little take here, hopefully you'll understand why these animals are so endearing and why they are such a good subject for doing science. Look at him. He's smoothing his hands across the surface of his Porsche. But unfortunately, it's a valuable piece of real estate and somebody is going to take it from him. And what these very simple animals allow us to do is to ask them very simple questions. And asking those simple questions, we get very straightforward answers as to how they see the world. Now, why on earth would you want to look at the world through the eyes of a dung beetle? Well, it really depends on what sort of knowledge you're seeking. And just to give Vitz a little punt, that's the crest of my university. And if you look at the motto at the bottom of the crest, it says, Scientia et Labore. And that isn't science, it's actually knowledge. Knowledge and work. We're pretty hardcore at Vitz, you know, so we don't mess around. So it's knowledge, and it's a particular type of knowledge. And it's scientific knowledge. It's a, it's a particular way of interpreting the world. And if we use a beetle as a very objective source of information about the world, we can actually understand how certain behaviors have evolved. And certain behaviors that we have, like orientation and navigation, if we can f unravel those complex behaviors in a very simple animal, we can maybe understand how we have come to um, use these behaviors ourselves. But knowledge for knowledge's sake, I think is a very important thing. Do you know what that is? The Mars rover, do you know what it's called? What's its name? No, not the scarab. Curiosity. Do you know how much it cost? 2.3 billion US dollars. How has curiosity improved your life? How, what changes it made to your life? Not a single iota, but nevertheless, we as humans are prepared to pay that sort of money to satisfy our own curiosity. And I think that alone is a good enough reason to pursue um, questions of science. Okay, so let's get back to the grubby stuff. So what we're talking about here is an animal that's really at the bottom end of the food chain. It really is at the back end of the food chain. It is eating waste material from another organism. I mean, it's, what a crazy way to, to make a living. It seems bizarre that you could actually get any nutrition out of this stuff after the original owner has actually finished with it. And what I'm hopefully going to show you is how dung beetles have got ways in which they extract nutrition from dung and in which ways in which they um, optimize the way they handle the dung and move it across the planet. So the first thing to notice or to know about dung beetles, as the little video said, there are a lot of them. So there are about 800 species in South Africa, 2,000 species in Africa, 6,000 species worldwide. Dung is a very tight market. There are a lot of people interested in this stuff. And what we see is hi highly specialized in individuals that have sliced the market so that they can um, take advantage of a particular type of dung in a particular way. And most of us know about the ball rolling species because they're very obvious they roll across the surface of the planet. But in fact, they are the least common. Only about 10% of dung beetles actually roll balls. So even for a dung beetle, it's a very, very odd behavior. And the reason we think they roll balls is because of this. Looks a bit like a bar on a Friday night. Um, probably the same sort of atmosphere as well. Um, those, that's all one species. They are competing for this limited resource at, at that point in time. So what do the rest of the dung beetles do? 
most dung beetles are actually tunneling species, and if you don't want to get the stuff under your fingernails, you will never see them. You've actually got to poke around in the poo. You've got to turn over the, the dung pat and flip it over and look for these guys that are living underneath the pat. And what they do is they make tunnels down into the soil beneath the pat, and they make little nests. And they basically sequester this resource away from other competitors where they can do two things with it. They can either eat it themselves or they can lay an egg in it. And here are our ball rolling species over here, um, the 10% of them rolling the ball away because we think the competition here is just too intense. And in fact, there is a shortage of space underneath the dung pad. It starts to look like Tokyo, except it's made of poo and it's upside down. But otherwise, it's, um, it's sort of high density living. OK, so what happens in a dung beetle's life cycle? Well, it's a very typical insect in that it has a, an egg, a larva, a pupal stage, and an adult stage. The adult stage is popped off the top there. There's the adult over there. So what we're looking at here is an, a specialization within the life cycle of one individual. This is one individual. From an egg, turns into a larva. What do you think its job is? To grow, to eat goes through a resting stage, a metamorphosis. It reorganizes its body completely and emerges as an adult over here. So it's the same individual that this individual here now has a completely different role in life. What is its role? To reproduce. So this one is an eating machine, and this one is a sex machine. And that's its job. It's to disperse and to reproduce and carry those genes into the next generation. So this stuff here is a vehicle for this animal to get its genes into the next generation. And that's why it's so passionate about it, because its whole life, its whole inheritance or depe um, dynasty depends on it doing a good job. Other interesting thing about this is that that food packet that is made by usually the female beetle, you know the way it goes, girls. So it's the girls that do most of the work here, sorry. Um, the female makes this package, lays an egg in it, and it's a bit like getting a lunchbox going to school, except you're sort of stuffed inside it, and the lid goes down, and then you've got to eat your way out of it. And that's the only meal you're going to get as a developing individual, and it will dictate everything about your life, because it will dictate how big you are, and... Um, how you will proceed as an adult in the rest of your life. Okay, so that's the basic life cycle of a dung beetle. And what I propose to do now is take you on a tour of South Africa and look at different species of dung beetles in different parts of the country and really just give you a little taste of the research that we've been involved in um, in opening up these beetles' lives to knowledge, really. So we're going to start in... Gauteng, where you look at it, feeding of a particular species, move up to the north to um, Limpopo and look at orientation behavior, then head down to the Kalahari to look at orientation behavior at night, and then head down to the Eastern Cape, get a bit of sex in, you always cheap jokes, you always get cheap laughs so with a bit of sex, and then we'll finish off in the Western Cape um, and look at beetles, uh, the way they not only orientate, but they navigate, and also the way they walk, which is actually pretty bizarre. Okay, so here's our first candidate. It's called Euonetus ellis intermedius. Um, there's a rule in entomology, that's the study of insects. The smaller the animal, the bigger the name. Um, so this guy's tiny, he's only about a, a, um, a centimeter long, and he's a tunneling species, so he's got a little horn on the front of his head. What do you think he does with the horn? What? what? What do animals do with horns? Yeah, they fight. So this tiny little beetle, about a centimeter long, has got an attitude. And he wants to keep everyone out of his little tunnel because there's a girl at the end of the tunnel that he wants to have sole access to. So this is a feisty little guy. And the female, on the other hand, is responsible for creating the brood ball. And this is a thing of great beauty. You never Did you ever think you would be looking at a slide of poo and thinking, Gosh, that's fabulous. Look at the way it glistens. And 
what, we've, what I want you to look at is the, the fibrous nature of the dung, and then this little thing here. This, this woman's an artist. She doesn't just lay an egg. She goes, <laughs> and puts this little Mr. Whippy thing that she pops the egg on top of. We don't even know which end of the beetle this comes out of. We don't know if it comes out of her mouth or it comes out of her anus. We haven't a clue. We don't really know what it's for, but it's pretty fascinating, isn't it? I mean, now you want to know what this is for. We call this the maternal gift. It's quite romantic. Don't think. Okay, so that's what the ball looks like. Then let's look at an analysis of poo. So... I don't know if you had a meal in the restaurant tonight, but you probably would have eaten protein in some form or another because you're after the nitrogen. You take that protein out of whatever it was that you ate, whether it was a vegetable or a, another animal, you chop it down into its component parts and you rebuild it into your own beautiful body. You need nitrogen. Look how much nitrogen there is in raw dung. It is extremely low in nitrogen. It's rubbish food. If we look at the foregut of the beetle that is eating that dung, so we literally dissect out what the beetle has eaten to find out which bits it's selected, it's actually doubled the nitrogen content of its food source. This is a clever beetle. If you could do that in the restaurant this evening, you could have halved your order. You wouldn't need to um, worry about the beef burger. You could have probably just concentrated on the lettuce. Um, there's the beetle's excreta. There's the brood ball. So that's what the larva has to eat. Oh, that looks pretty rubbish. And then there's the maternal gift. Not bad. So mom's put a little protein gift in there for the baby. But how on earth does the beetle double the nitrogen content of its food source? And the way it does it is by doing this. If you look at the particle size that comes out of the beetle's gut, it's eating the tiny little itty bitty bitty bits. These are thousands uh, or millionths of a millimeter. But thousands of a millimeter. I've got a physicist in the audience. I better get my units right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it's eating things that are around about 100 microns in size. Somehow this beetle with its soft mouth parts is filtering out the best bit of the poo and, and that's what it's eating. Look at the brood ball, pretty rubbish. And then the maternal gift, well, not so bad. It doesn't look as if there's been too much sorting there. So the larva has to deal with a much coarser foodstuff than the adult. And that makes sense because the larva has actually got jaws. So the, that larva inside the lunchbox, inside the brood ball, actually has to chew its food. So you were always told to chew your food as a young child, and now you know why because you've got to break down the crunchy bits. But it's, it's still a very poor food source. So if we look at this data now, what we're looking at here are the likelihood of having symbionts in the gut system. So a symbiont is another organism that lives in close associa or association with a, another organism and, in fact, benefits its lifestyle. And we're discovering at the moment that Humans have got lots of symbionts in our guts. We call it the microbiota or the microbiome. And it can dictate whether you get fat, whether you get diabetes. Um, the way you digest your food can be dictated by the microorganisms in your gut. Look at the dung beetle. Exactly the same. There's the larval gut in red. And those are the two adult guts over here. And look at the larval gut. Cellulose degradation. Cellulose, that's where the carbon is. It's, that's what grass is made of. That's where the energy is. And the larva is able to degrade cellulose more efficiently than the adults. Look at this one, nitrogen fixation. Remember I said that nitrogen is the key thing that we need to build bodies. The air is full of nitrogen. The air is about 80% nitrogen. If you can grab it out of the air... That's a perfect place to get nitrogen. So we call that nitrogen fixation. And guess what? The larvae have got nitrogen fixers in their gut. They're getting air, nitrogen out of the air. And then finally, here's this uric acid metabolism. Uric acid is basically beetle pee. That's what beetles urinate. They don't produce urine. But it's, a, again, a nitrogen waste. It's nitrogen rich. 
if you can recycle your urine, remember you're trapped in the lunchbox anyway, if you can recycle that nitrogen source, then you can also benefit from it. So what we've got here is a fabulous system where the two stages of the beetle's life, the larva and the adult, are both specialists in the way they approach the same food source, but they're not actually act eating the same stuff. Okay, let's head on on our journey. So we'll now go further north, look at a species called Scarabaeus. Sorry about the Latin names, but they don't have common names. And just look at this guy's behavior. He's actually heading that way. He's walking backwards. He's got his head down. What can he see? He can see where he's been. He can't see where he's going. And the only other thing he can possibly see is the sky. Okay, let's just take a little um, sexual sideshow because it's always worth throwing in a few smutty jokes. So this is a male dung beetle. How do you know it's a male dung beetle? It's got hairy legs. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Um, so these little hairs on his legs... Uh, he's using to rub a pheromone off his body. There he goes. He's rubbing it off his body, and then he's releasing it into the atmosphere. What's a pheromone? A pheromone is a chemical message. It's like a hormone, except it leaves the body. A hormone, the message stays in the body, and a pheromone, the message leaves the body. And what's the message here? The message is, <whistles> come and have a good time. And he calls in a female... She'll fly in, picks up the pheromone. She copulates with him, hopefully, if he's in look, climbs down to the end of the tunnel. There's a little shallow tunnel here, and he's put a little box of chocolates at the end of the tunnel for her. It's a little blob of poo that he's given her as a nuptial gift, uh, and it's his investment in the next generation. But this is the worst part. Sometimes dung beetles cheat. How do the males feel about this, guys? Even dung beetles cheat. Sometimes they get to the, the girl gets to the end of the tunnel and there are no chocolates. And, and I've got three daughters and I always say to them, check out the chocolates before you make any commitments and this sort of thing. Okay, so here we're going to ask a beetle a question. And the question we're asking this beetle is, do you know where you're going? Do you know that you want to head off in a straight line. And we give it a little set of gymnastics. It's a bit like um, gladiators for dung beetles. And what we're doing here is basically putting some sort of disturbance in its path. Look, it does a little dance, and it heads off in exactly the same direction it was going in the first place. That simple little animal knows exactly where it's going. And these are the sort of data we can produce from those sorts of experiments. And what we've got here is there's the dung ball goes up over the ramp, drops off, and heads off in a new direction. So we compare the original ball rolling direction with the reorientation direction. And we average it out over 25 individuals. Each of those dots represents one beetle. If we don't like those data points there, we just step on them, because they're only insects. We don't, we don't really. It's, just a, it's called cleaning your data. Um, <laughs> But, but the average here is, if you look at it, that A, what's the average reorientation angle? It's 1.2 degrees. Do these beetles know where they're going? Absolutely. Um, they know exactly where they want to go. The other figures really just tell you that it's, it is a very statistically significant result. So how do they do it? What are they doing? Where, how, how do they manage to do this? I probably won't find my way home tonight if my wife doesn't take me. I've got a appalling sense of direction. These guys know exactly where they're going. What do they, what do, they do? What are they up to? And we th took this dance as part of the clue that they may be looking at something around them to actually get some sort of orientation cue. So how do you ask a dung beetle are you looking at the sky? And it's actually very easy. You just put a little hat on it. So that sort of golf peak that the beetle's wearing there, its eyes are completely functional, but it just cannot see the sky. And what happens to a dung beetle when you put a cap on it, you will see that it has a completely different behavior. This is a slightly different model of cap. You know, we have a range of caps uh, for dung beetles. Uh, the streetwear for dung beetles. 
Um, but as you can see, totally lost. Clearly, the answer is yes, that animal needs to look at the sky to find its way across the landscape. I'm glad you're sympathetic towards them. I, they're very endearing. OK, so what are they looking at in the sky? It's got to be the sun. Has to be. How do you test that? Dead easy. You just move the sun. So you thought the physicists were clever. <laughs> Watch this. You get a mirror. So this is Marie. She's a Swedish colleague of mine. So I work with people from Lund University. She's shining the sun from this angle. And Basil over here is blocking the sun from its original point of view. So what they're doing is they're shifting the sun through a 180. And look what happens to the beetle. He says, oh, I've made a mistake. And he heads off. And you too can do this experiment at home. <laughs> Just make sure you put plenty of newspaper down and there are no children in the room. Um, but it works a treat. So are they looking at the sun? Absolutely. And what we've done over the years, and this has taken a long time, and it's been great fun, but we've shown that during the day, they use the sun, they use polarized light, and they also use an intensity gradient across the sky as an orientation device. So they've got a hierarchy of cues. The sun is the number one cue, but um, if, it, if it's not available, they've got this fallback system that they can look at these other um, cues that are there. We've also shown at night, because there are nocturnal species, that can use, again, the moon. That's not surprising, because the moon is really just a mirror of the sun. They use polarized light, which is something that you and I can't see in the sky. Um, so I'm not even going to explain it. And they also use the stars. And that's the bit I want to tell you about now. So we move down into the Kalahari um, to a place 70 k's outside Freiburg. There is no light pollution. That's the moon going down behind um, uh, the structure in the campsite we work in. And there's this fabulous little beetle called Scarabaeus satyrus. It's a nocturnal ball roller. As I told you, the dung market's tight. If you can roll a ball at night, you are going to have very, very few competitors to deal with. The only difficulty you're going to have is finding your way through the night habitat, uh, uh, habitat in the dark using the night sky. And so what happened, this is, to me, is a sort of classic way of doing science. We'd spent loads of weeks over several years looking at whether the beetles use the moon. And, you know, you do your experiments, and then it, we've worked all day, and then we work all night. Then you sit down, and the moon's gone down, and you have a beer. Excuse me. It's only water, but we'll get into the cocktails later. And you look up at the sky, and you think, God, that's fantastic. So this is the the Milky Way in the Kalahari next to Freiburg. And you think, if we can see the stars, surely the beetles can see the stars. Ping, next experiment. So this is the experiment that we won the Ig Nobel Prize for in 2013, to showing that dung beetles are able to navigate or orientate by the Milky Way. And what we did is we built this arena, which we called the roulette arena, the reason we called it the roulette arena is because we numbered the pockets that are around the edge of the arena. Because when it comes down to it, science is actually grunt work. You've got to repeat things over and over and over again to make sure that you're getting good data. And it's pretty boring doing the same thing over and over and over through the night. So you, you number the pockets, and then you put bets on it. Two rand. You can win a couple, you can win a couple of rand through the course of a night. This is amazing stuff. So what we were expecting was the beetles to fall into these pockets as they exited the arena. We didn't want any observer sticking their head over the arena because we were worried that that would be a landmark that the beetles could use the silhouette of the head against the sky. So the only thing these beetles could see was the Milky Way or the, the starry sky. They couldn't see us. We didn't use a camera. And instead what we did is that we inserted the beetles up into the bottom of the arena from the middle there are the pockets there. And they arrived into the middle of the arena on this little disc over here. And the principle was very simple. If the beetle was orientating, it would exit the um, arena in a very short space of time. And it would fall into one of the pockets at the edge of the arena. If it was lost, 
it would take a long time to exit the arena and we would fall asleep underneath the table and um, but what we were waiting for was that sound Tonk. beetle falling into a pocket two ran sir it's yours you bet on pocket number 11 and the time between releasing the beetle and it arriving in the pocket and these are the data that we got from this experiment so what we're looking at here is time to exit the arena in seconds. So this beetle is out in 40 seconds. That's pretty quick. And that's when it can see the stars. We put one of our bespoke caps on the little chap, and he takes two minutes. He's lost. And that A there denotes that it's significantly different from that. So it's statistically different. And then one night we had a, um, an overcast night, and again, they were lost. There was no information in the sky available to them, and they couldn't ma make it. So that was great. We'd shown that the beetles could use the stars, but we hadn't really been able to manipulate the sky because it's just a bit too big to fit into a mirror. However, at Vitz, we're very lucky because we've got a planetarium. And I think as a biologist, there are two places you should try and do an experiment before you die. One is in an aquarium, and the other one is in a planetarium. And uh, we took these... Um, we took our idea to Claire Flanagan, who was running the planetarium at that time and said, um, can we bring some dung beetles into your uh, planetarium? She said, oh yeah, fantastic. And then, can we do it at night? Oh yeah, fantastic. She was so enthusiastic. The only thing she wouldn't let us do is touch this thing. This is the projector. It was built in 1938 in Germany. And so she stayed up all night with us and she adjusted the sky for us and we played with the beetles and it was fantastic. So this is what the sky looks like in the Joburg Planetarium. You can just about see the projector there. You might be able to see it down there. There's the projector. And there's the night sky, and there's the Milky Way. Okay, so what did the data look like? Well, we've seen this before from the field, cap, stars, and overcast. Here we go. ba -dang, the big experiment. Foomp. Exactly the same statistically as the stars in the field. They interpreted the stars on the roof of the planetarium or the ceiling of the planetarium exactly the way they did the night sky. So now we could play. This was the best part. So there's our open sky in the field. There's the full sky in the planetarium. And then we took out the Milky Way and we only gave them the stars. No significant difference. It's a bit slower, but they're, they're fine. Then we took away all the stars and just gave them the Milky Way. Cha-ching! They could orientate. And we published a paper saying that beetles can orientate by the Milky Way. And it was just fantastic. People got blown away by this. Somebody wrote an article in the New Yorker about these tiny animals looking at the edge of our galaxy to find, <laughs> find their way home. It's just fabulous. It's just really great that people got revved by tiny little beetles. Okay, so then what we did is we only gave them, we gave them 16 bright, oh, sorry, 18 bright stars. They got lost. They were significantly slower. And then if we gave them the dim stars, they were fine. No significant difference. And so what we think they're actually looking at is they're not looking at the Milky Way, really. They're looking at a light intensity gradient across the sky. And we're pretty certain of that because we know that a beetle can't resolve a star with its eyes. And the way I can explain that to you is they view the world in pixels about the size of your index finger held at arm's length. So I don't recognize. Does anyone in the front row I should recognize? But so if I knew you, so there'd be about 40 pixels. I should be able to identify you. Where Jay, I've just met, is about two pixels. There's no way I would be able to identify you because you can't resolve an image that is so coarse. So we think it's actually an intensity gradient that they were using across the sky. And then we switched off all the lights, and I fell asleep underneath the table, and they got lost again, 140 or 120 seconds to exit the arena. Beetles can use the stars in the sky and the Milky Way to find their way around. Okay, just another little aside while we're in the Kalahari, and it's not one that I put on the list, but I think it's interesting, is that, again, it's one of these experiments that arose from us just standing there with a beer, excuse me. And you're thinking, God, I'm hot. 
because it's boiling hot in the Kalahari, and the, and the ground is 60 degrees centigrade, and you're standing out there making this poor little animal roll its ball across the hot sand. You're thinking, I'm hot. That beetle must be hot too. And we noticed that they were dancing more when it was hot. And at first we thought it was something to do with the sun. I mean, we're scientists, you know. Then we realized it must be because the ground is so hot, they're trying to get off the ground. And the other thing we noticed was that when they were on top of the ball, they did this face-wiping behavior, and they seemed to be quite distressed. So we, detect, we decided we would test this by giving them a hot arena and a cold arena. And we basically just left one open to the sun. We shaded the other. We swapped them around on different days so we didn't get an arena effect. And then we got a cool thing called a thermal camera, and we took an infrared image of this. And just look at it. So there's scientific evidence that dung is cool. See? It's around about 30 degrees centigrade. But look at the temperature of the sand. It's up over 60 degrees centigrade. It's berserk. And this little guy, nevertheless, is managing to keep his body temperature somewhere in the high 30s, maybe touching 40, which is where most animals keel over because their proteins start to denature. And his little brain, which was stuck in the sand in that original picture I showed you, is actually remaining quite cool. And if we look at the data that came out of this, cold arenas are in blue, red arenas are in um, uh, red arenas are hot, and you look at the number of the dances the beetle made, then as it got hotter, the beetle danced more. And our conclusion was that the beetle is actually using the dung ball as a thermal refuge. And you do exactly the same when you go onto a hot beach and you've forgotten your flip-flops. You, you either use somebody else's towel or you put your towel down and you go, and then you go, tuck -tuck 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 -tuck, and you put your towel down again or step on someone, sorry, do you mind if I borrow your towel? Yeah, because it's called stilting. You've got to get off the hot surface, otherwise you will overheat. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. And the, but in terms of science and evolution, this is brilliant. There's a dung ball which has originated as a food source. It's a, a feeding source. We've seen that it's a nuptial gift, so you can give it to your girlfriend. And now it's a thermal refuge. So evolution has seconded this item into several roles that have improved the survival and uh, persistence of these individuals that do this, and therefore that behavior will be selected for and carried on to into the next generation. We couldn't resist it. Um, we thought it was mediated through their front legs, so we gave them little oven gloves. We kind of, you know, we thought the boots went with the caps, you know. T-shirts are next. Um, and if you look over here on the side, the number of climbs on each roll, when they've got boots on, they climb onto the balls less. So they're clearly insulated from the ground, and it's been mediated through the front legs, and that's what's actually getting the beetles up onto their balls. The other one was just too easy. <laughs> you put the balls in the fridge. So you give them cool dung balls, and they just love it because it's this great big heat sink. It's like having a big piece of ice cream that you push across the felt. And every now and then you just climb on top of it and take a little nibble, cools you down. Whereas if we had a hot ball, then they climbed onto the ball far more often. Okay, so let's head off uh, down into the Eastern Cape. Spectacular beetle. This is the Addo elephant um, dung beetle. Uh, again, a lot of myths about dung beetles. This one's, oh no, it's a an elephant specialist rubbish. I normally collect it off a human midden, and one of my colleagues at um, uh, P University has just proven by isotope analysis that he thinks it's a rat dung specialist, which kind of breaks my heart a little bit. But it's an enormous beetle. It weighs about 10 grams. It's bigger than a mouse. It's a spectacular thing. Here's the grubby sex. So got to work this one out for yourself. We looked at their testes. We couldn't resist it. So what we've got here is relative testes size. So how big are your balls, boy -o? Well, it depends on how big your body is. So interpret this graph for me. Here's a big beetle. <laughs> Shame. 
makes the rest of us feel a lot better. So big Sicilian backers stand a chance of getting a female because they can fight at the dung pat and win fights and get access to females and get matings. The little guys don't stand a chance because they're they didn't get enough lunch in their lunchbox when their mom made it in the first place. But they've got a backup plan. So instead of investing in bulk, what they've done is invested in testes. So if they get a chance to mate with a female, they will transfer an enormous amount of sperm in the hope of sh her using that sperm to generate um, a new individual. So again, we've got a, a sexual selection tactic. While we're down in the Cape, and I didn't show you this one on the start either, this is also to show you that the diversity of dung beetles that, and the diversity of lifestyles in dung beetles. This is a species called Skeliages. There's seven spe uh, species in the genus, and guess what? They eat millipedes, and they try to roll millipedes as well. And this is amazing. That how on earth does this guy see? Because he's got his head stuffed under his food source the whole time. How does he orientate or navigate or do anything when he's trying to push a great big dead millipede around the world? We don't know if they kill the millipedes. We don't know if they eat the millipedes. We don't know if they lay their eggs in the millipedes. If anybody wants to do a PhD on Skeliages, the world is your oyster. Um, you've just got to catch them. But spectacular little beetles, again capitalizing in a certain portion of the market of dead things and puffy things. Um, okay, but let's return to our theme of orientation. For most dung beetles, it's a one-way trip. You arrive at the poo, you grab a big piece of the cake, and then you hurtle off to some sort of co little corner on your own, and you eat it in wonderful solitude. And basically what they're doing is avoiding competition. And, and you do that at the lunch table at work. You fill up your plate and you go off and then you stuff your face because you've effectively delimited the competition that you have to deal with. The important thing is, is that for most beetles, it's a one-way trip. They've never been into that habitat ever before. They fly in, could be 10 kilometers, they fly into the poop, grab a piece, off, bury it, eat it over five days, maybe lay an egg in it, never return. Next time they just fly off somewhere else. So there's no reason for them to know anything about their habitat. And there's no reason, them, reason for them to do anything but orientate in a straight line away from the bun fight at the lunch table. Because the last thing they want to, they want to do is end up back at the lunch table where somebody's going to steal their lunch. So all they need to do is go in a straight line. However, down in the Western Cape, you know they're different down there. Um, there's this spectacular genus called Pachysoma. They can't fly. That's already interesting. Um, we think it's to conserve moisture. And they've got this very odd um, orientation, uh, sorry, foraging behavior. Can you spot the difference? It's going forwards. This is completely different. I told you they were different in the Cape. And what else is he doing? He's not rolling a wet dung ball. He's actually dragging a dry pellet. So this is a radically different way of probably dealing with a very arid habitat where dung is not necessarily freely available. But there's one other behavior that they've got which is really fascinating for us, and it's this. This is a little pile of sheep droppings you never thought you'd sit in a bar looking at sheep droppings, did you? you don't, you've got to watch out what they're putting on the counter. Okay, and he's making a little nest. Doesn't like that. Goes back and returns to the sheep pellets and then back to his nest. This is a completely different type of behavior. This is not orientation. This is navigation because it involves going from one known position to another known position and returning and going back to that position. For me, as someone who can't find their way home, this is spectacular. This guy knows exactly where he is. The other interesting thing is that often the outward journey is more convoluted than the homeward journey, where he goes all the way around the house. 
but he goes straight back. He knows exactly where home is. Of course, we're in southern Africa. You know the way life is. It's tough, it's dangerous, and people steal your sheep pellets. Um, but anyway, so how, how are they doing it? Well, it's probably by a mechanism that's known as path integration. And so what we've got here, here's the beetle. There's his house. There's his feeding site over there. Beetle heads out along a convoluted path, finds the dung source, and then it bullets straight for home. It knows exactly where home is. Now, how does it know where home is? It, there can be two hypotheses to explain its homing ability. One is that it knows the landmarks there. And you and I are landmark navigators. That's how we find our way around. Um, pubs over here, shops are over there, the church is over here, universities over there. And you walk through a mental map in your head. And that's a very complex behavior. You need a lot of brain power to do that. It's probably not very good at it. Um, the other way of finding a way around is to use something called path integration, that you use the sun to set a bearing by, and then you just keep on that bearing um, till you reach your destination, whether it's the feeding source or or the nest. And there's a very easy way to test this. Again, we can ask the beetle, are you using path integration? And what we do is we displace the beetle when it's at the feeding site. If it's using landmarks, it should find its way home. If it's using path integration, it should get lost in a very, very particular way. It should follow the same bearing and roughly the same distance, but it won't find home. So let's watch what happens here. This is the evil experimenter dressed in black. It's always good to have a sort of dramatic experimenter. Pulls the dupe over to a new position. He grabs a pellet, and what's going to happen? That's where the burrow was. That's where the forage is. That's the displacement that it's been through. If it is using landmarks, and there's a great big fat landmark there, it should find its way home. If it's using path integration, it should end up in the bushes over there. OK, so watch what happens. Dupe grabs his pellet, heads off, do, 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 do. Toast. He's lost. Shame. But watch where he turns. It's about the right distance. He knows where the nest should be, but he's in the wrong spot. Despite this massive landmark, which should be on the other side of him, he's completely lost. And the evil experimenter exits, exits scene left, and the beetle wanders off into oblivion. Okay, so how is he doing it? Well, we think that they're probably using some sort of odometer. They have to, because you've got the bearing from the sun, but you also have to measure the distance. And the odometer has been shown in other animals, such as ants and crabs, to be actually a step counting mechanism, which is pretty spectacular that a very small animal can count its steps. We don't know if the dung beetles are actually counting their steps, but we have got a clue in this species here. And this is a species, again, of Pachysoma. It lives in the Western Cape, and it has got a very particular way of moving. This is another member of the genus Pachysoma that walks, and it's a classic insect tripod gait. Insects have got six legs, and that means they can put three down at one time in a tripod, and they swing the other tripod forward and plonk that one down. And they swing in the tripod forward and plonk the other one down. So the tripod gait is the way to walk on this planet. There are more species of insects than other any organism, and they Pretty much all, we estimate there's five million of them, walk with the tripod gait. However, if you watch this guy, he's got something else up his sleeve. They don't come with numbers on them, by the way. We, we put those on. I wanted to call this one Chad Leclo, but the, the Swedes didn't really understand the joke. But what you can see here is that the animal is using its legs in pairs. And so instead of using them like a tripod, they're actually using them in joint pairs, and it's swinging itself forward. And we suspect that this stops it slipping in the sand. 
because of its us using its legs in pairs, it's less likely to slip and make a counting error and be able to find its way home. We haven't proven this at all. We've got no data whatsoever. So there's another PhD waiting there if anybody wants to spend their lives in the Macquarland, boiling their brains and watching dung beetles hurtle across the landscape. Okay, so just to summarize, we've taken a little trip around the country, um, looked at feeding, looked at orientation behavior down here, looked at a little bit of sex over here, and looked at some galloping down here. And, you know, so what? It's, it, they're little just-so stories. I don't think so, um, because I think they do fit together in a bigger picture. And just to give you an idea of the bigger picture that we're fitting together now, is that in the north, in the east here, we have w the wet ball rolling species. He's moving in that direction. He's going in that direction with a big ball of wet poo. Down in the southwest here, he's heading in that direction with a little dry pellet. And what's happened is we've discovered this guy in the middle of the country. So this is the wet side of the country. This is the dry side of the country. In the middle, we've got an intermediate species. And watch what he does. The dung doesn't come in Petri dishes either, but, you know, but he grabs a wet pellet and watch which way he's rolling it. He's going backwards. So he's got a pellet collecting behavior, which is like the guy in the southwest, but he's collecting wet pellets rather than dry pellets. He's rolling it backwards, and best of all, look what he's doing. He's provisioning a nest, just like the guy in the southwest. So he can orientate, but in many, many of his other behaviors, he's an intermediate between those two species. And we think by unpicking the way this animal has learned or evolved to navigate, we'll be able to understand how navigation has evolved in other animals and um, in ourselves. So what we're looking at is, a, is really a, a pattern across the countryside of how these animals utilize dung and navigate their way through it. Okay, this is a, a picture of the people I work with. As I said, they're Swedish, so there's a strong ABBA theme on many of our field trips. Um, this is Marie Dacker. She's the boss. She leads most of it. And this is Basil here with the mirror. He's a neurobiologist. Jochen is an um, animal behaviorist. Emily is also a behaviorist. She's a Australian. And we have a great time, which I think is very important. Uh, there is a TED talk on this on YouTube. Marie has also done a, a, a YouTube talk um, about orientation. She's at Lund University. And I just want to say thank you to you lot for laughing at all the crappy jokes. And thank you very much.